Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. Today, I want to talk about Lila Rose's recent appearance on The Dr. Phil Show, where she debated Dr. Phil and other guests and members of the audience on the issue of abortion. Right out the gate, I want to say that Lila did a really good job. She's a very gifted pro-life apologist. She has an understanding of media and sound bites. And we need a lot more young pro-life apologists, especially women, being able to go out in public to make this case. So she did a great job. What I want to do here is I just want to comment on it, point out what's going on, give other people tips for if they find themselves, maybe not on Dr. Phil, but who knows, or just in conversations with other people, how to navigate this issue. Now, when I do talk about this, I want to be clear, and I'm not offering any harsh criticisms of Lila. I think she did a really good job. But I might say there's other points she might have been able to bring up or other avenues that might have been more effective. But I don't want that to take away from the fact she did a good job. This is really hard. As someone who has done debates, who has been in the hot seat, it's very easy for other people to say, oh, well, you should have done this or, oh, you should have done that. Well, when you're in the hot seat, it's very hard to make those snap decisions and judgments. And a lot of times you look back and say, yeah, I could have said this or I could have said that. So in saying this, my goal is to serve everyone watching this when you have these conversations to give you the tools that are most helpful to have really good conversations on pro-life issues. But we can learn a lot just from watching how Lila handled being in a setup that's not very fair to her position. She has the host going after her. Uh, she's got the nearly all the audiences against her, but she held her own quite well. So I'm going to jump into two clips from that I found online from her appearance, and I'll give some of my thoughts as I play through them. No one here is pro-death, and no one here is pro-abortion. The difference is pro-choice and pro-life. Except Dr. Phil hasn't talked to radical feminists or even many people on the left who say abortion on demand without apology or shout your abortion. There are people who are pro-abortion, so we shouldn't act like that's not true. Lila, you, you say some things in the predicate of your positions that life begins at fertilization, that science is very clear about that. And you, you have to know science isn't, there, there's no consensus among the scientific community there is, that, Dr. Phil. 96% no, of scientists not. say that I, life begins at fertilization. If no, you're an in vitro specialist, well, no, you're let, looking to create let me, let me a single cell embryo, and then you know you have a new human life. So it, it is a scientific fact. Well, actually, it's not. Well, when, do you, when do you say human life begins then? There's, well, it's, it doesn't matter what I think. I, I, I don't care what I think. What I'm saying is well, the scientific is, community does not have a consensus about when life begins. And that is so this is a very difficult position to be in, where what you're arguing about is something abstract and based on authority. What do scientists believe about the question of when life begins? And if you're not able to just pull out a bunch of books or slides or sources, what will end up happening here is each side will say, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. And it's left up to the audience to, to decide Who's right about this, Lila Rose or Dr. Phil? And some of them will think, oh, well, Dr. Phil, he, he's on the side with the other scientists, except, of course, he's a psychologist who wrote a book on weight loss. Uh, the question of when human life begins is way outside of his wheelhouse. So it's unfortunate here in this clip, because this is a central question, are the unborn human beings, when does life begin? And Lila is correct that there is a scientific consensus on this. It would have been a little more helpful to reference, I, I think I know what she's referencing, and this is a 2019 article from a dissertation published by Steve Jacobs, where he interviewed thousands of biologists and asked them when life begins. And they came forward and said, even those who said they were pro-choice, that 96% of them said that life begins at fertilization. So I think it would have been helpful here for Lila to have been able to cite that particular source, because I would, because what you could say to Dr. Phil is, why should I believe that? Can you cite a scientist, Dr. Phil, can you cite a scientist who says that we have no idea when human life begins? Can you cite anyone? And then I might say, what about, I can cite several, Ronan Overheely and Fabiola Mueller in human embryology and teratology, Langman's embryology. I can cite pro-choice philosophers like David Boonin. Who can you cite? And I bet he can't cite anybody. And I'd say, well, that's, that's just your opinion. But you don't want to be in the position of, Science says life begins at conception. Someone else says, no, scientists don't agree. And then, yes, they do. No, they don't. 
it's always helpful to have something else to put out there or to shift it to a more general argument. Like the unborn are growing, they must be alive. Look, they have human parents, they must be human. Uh, aren't they valuable? Are they a part of a body or are they a developing organism? Sim it's simply inaccurate. That's not true. You can go to the body A single of cell embryo is a unique new human life. You can go to the body of scientific literature and you can find neuroscientists who say that it begins when there is a detectable brain wave. But Dr. Phil, in to... an abortion, if it's not a human life, why do you have to kill it? I haven't spoken over you and you keep speaking over me. And I assume that's because you don't want me to finish my thought, which is if Anyone here wants to fact check me instead of speak over me, you can go to the scientific literature and query. And I will leave a link in the description below where I've answered this question online. I have cited embryologists, pro-choice philosophers, Planned Parenthood themselves in court cases have admitted to this. And I think Lila was definitely on the right track to, to put forward particular arguments to say, well, if we don't know when human life begins, and so she's saying when a IVF technician creates embryos, how does he know that they're human embryos that he's about to implant in a woman who wants to do IVF, right? Because if he put a dog embryo inside of her, uh, he'd be in really big trouble. That would be a, bi you know, a bioethical nightmare Frankenstein experiment. But how does he know these human embryos he creates, a single-celled embryo, are human? that they're human organisms. So I think it was great that she brought up that point. I think she was putting forward a lot of points to defend her position. And so what Dr. Phil does is he does the you interrupted me gambit. But the thing is, people interrupt each other all the time on these things. So, you know, and now that he says that, she's going to allow him to speak for a long time and he'll be able to go uninterrupted and it'll be difficult to challenge him. But I will challenge him because, well, you know, he's wrong. What the definition is of the beginning of life, and you will find that there are different definitions. And it's up to you to decide what you think, but there is not a consensus among the scientific community. And it has actually evolved across time. Before we had sonograms, uh, it was a black box what was going on in there. Then when we got to the point we had sonograms and we could see, oh, you can detect a heartbeat. Okay, now, uh, up until then, it was referred to as quickening. Well, we discovered it was only in the past few centuries that we've discovered sperm, egg, and then the process of fertilization. But I really don't understand this argument. I would say, all right, so you're saying for a long time, we didn't understand the biology of conception. Therefore, we don't understand it now. That doesn't make sense. That's like saying for a long time, we didn't know the Earth's position in the solar system. Therefore, scientists don't agree on where the Earth is located in the solar system, whether the Earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the Earth. The fact that people were wrong about biological development, even people like St. Thomas Aquinas, who followed the biology of Aristotle, just because people were wrong in the past doesn't mean that we're wrong now. We have the scientific evidence on our side for the fact that a human being begins to exist after a successful fertilization. You can ask another question. Do you believe that after fertilization, you have a human embryo? Is it an embryo? Well, what is an embryo? It's a human organism at a particular stage of development. You can't define the terms embryo or fetus without referring to the human being that exists there. I can really feel Lila's frustration right here because if she interrupts him again, then it's like game over. She looks like the bad guy interrupting Dr. Phil. So she's run out of interrupt you cards because he said you're being mean and you interrupted me. But now, and now she's got to listen to this nonsense and wait till she has the right time to, to come back in. Technology, and then uh, it started to change. But you say it's at fertilization, but at fertilization, there actually hasn't been implantation. And then once there's implantation, then it, it, this is a process. And uh, it's all I'm saying is there's not a consensus. And you're saying there is, and that's factually inaccurate. All right, so yeah, it is a process of development, but it's the same human being throughout that process of development. Another question you could ask Dr. Phil is, all right, so if nobody knows when life begins, how can we ever say that murder is wrong? Because I could just say, well, you know, you murdered this guy or this baby, a newborn infant. How do you know their life has begun? If you assume, oh, well, life has definitely begun at birth. We just don't know before that. Well, how do you know? 
So I think that another path you might take is instead of saying, I might say, look, forget about life beginning of fertilization, right? Abortions take place. The earliest they're going to take place is, let's say, when the embryo is three or four weeks old at the earliest, when there's a detectable heartbeat. So the earliest abortions, I would say, Dr. Phil, what is being aborted in the earliest abortions that are done uh, chemically or surgically? I'm not, I'm not talking about preventing implantation with something like uh, a morning type of morning after pill. I'm talking about a chemical or surgical abortion after you've got a pregnancy test, positive pregnancy test. What is that thing that is aborted? It's growing. It must be alive. Has human DNA and human parents. It must be human. It's got a beating heart. It's growing and developing. It's not a part of the mother's body. Clearly, this must be a human being. What else could it be, Dr. Phil? We can we can agree to disagree, but I will say, you know, when I was but pregnant... But the literature with, doesn't disagree. Well, we can... I, we should look it up. It's 96% of scientists have agreed when surveyed. But regardless of that point, I think the question is, you know, we know deep down when you're pregnant, there's a new human life. You know, that's why it's so devastating for Nancy. Our miscarriage was so devastating. We all know that deep down. These are, these are human beings. That's why it's so contentious. Mm. And listen, we... Very shrewd pivot with a audience that's going to be more into emotions than appeal to authority. That Lila's saying, look, when somebody has a miscarriage, if it's not a human being, why do you say you feel bad they lost their baby? So very shrewd pivot on her part. Do we acknowledge that all humans have human rights? Because I think what your, your question well, is I, about I, I is about I agree with a lot heart. of your points. I'm just I, saying it comes down to when that life begins. But and I, that, I don't think Nancy saying. or others here, here are saying okay, they're not um, human beings. Like, the real yeah. argument we here we're having is about choice and a person's right to choose what is best for them, what is best for them regarding family planning, what is best for them regarding their bodies and their ownership. And when we are listening to this debate, we're... And so this uh, Christian Nunes, I think is her name, she's from the National Organization for Some Women. The group's called the National Organization of Women, but obviously it should be called the National Organization of Radical Feminist Women, because they certainly don't represent most women. And here it's important when someone is in a conversation like this that it was hard for Lila's position on Dr. Phil. You'll see this in the next clip that I'm going to show. Uh, they'll bring up the question of rape, the question of what about a child with, with a fetal deformity? And these are all very hard cases, but it's important to bring out in a soundbite situation, look, everyone agrees these are hard cases, but do they justify, justify abortion through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason? This woman wants abortion through all nine months for any reason, maybe after nine months. Who knows? If it's just about choice, why can't a woman who gives birth at home and didn't know she was pregnant commit infanticide? Is that not still her choice? If choice is your only argument, she's not even, because for her, she doesn't talk about whether life begins. Because even if it is a baby, she doesn't care. Because she thinks she should have a right to kill the baby no matter what. Bait, we're constantly getting it back to about who's deciding what. If you determine for yourself that's when life begins, that is fine for you. But someone else may determine something completely different. And this is where, from a pro-choice standpoint, we're saying it is not for us to decide for anyone what they believe, how they believe, but they, they have options. So I think we need to really pay attention to what pro-choice is really arguing, and what we're really talking about. It's about truly, if we are giving people the right to choose, we're allowing them to make the best decisions for themselves, for their bodies, and for their families. Do you have a story or a question? So, okay, so then if one person says that that uh, black people are not persons, and another person says that they are, great, each of them can live according to, to that particular belief. And one person wants to be a, a racist who discriminates or commits crimes against black people, well, they, I guess they could be allowed because they don't think black people are persons. That's their choice. You see where, the, where this, this kind of twisted logic goes, and that's what you get from National Organization for Women, most uh, grassroots level pro-choice activists. The, now, the philosopher types that I've deb debated before have much better arguments, but in the grassroots, these are these are not good. Pro-life grassroots advocates like Lila have way, way better arguments. So now I'm going to switch over to a longer clip. This is a part where they had just talked about a woman who, I think she was in Louisiana, and she had a child who was going to die shortly after birth, and they're saying, you know, why should I be forced to carry to bury? Why am I forced to carry my baby to term just to bury the baby after they're born? And it's phrased as if it's so cruel to not allow the, her to have an abortion. And so this story is presented. It's very emotional. And then Lila, what do you think? Once again, here's a hard case to distract from the vast majority of abortions that are done not to protect anybody's life, but to protect a, life, a person's lifestyle. 
do you think? Do you, you don't think Nancy should have been able to have an abortion? I mean, Nancy, my heart broke when I heard your story because that's the worst thing any mom wants to hear is that their baby is going to die. Their baby has a life-threatening illness. Um, my, my husband and I, we had a miscarriage about two years ago. They were some of the darkest days of my life. And they were dark days because it was our child. You know, we knew this was a baby. And I think that's the fundamental point here is that this, we're talking about a baby. We're talking about a human life. And the pro position is that all humans have human rights. And the first right is life, to not be killed. You know, from the moment of fertilization until natural death. And so, you know, Nancy, you deserve better. You deserve better health care. There's perinatal hospice, there's palliative care, so that your baby could be could die in the loving arms of their of their parents instead of at the abortionist tools. I think that was a very good answer. So notice that she starts with empathy, just starts with empathy. This is such a tragic situation for you to undergo. But then you have to bring it back to say, what is the caring thing to do here? That what people are saying this episode, it's so cruel to force someone to carry a baby who's going to die after to say, well, what's the alternative? They're killing the baby inside of the mother. What if we had a two-year-old who was dying? Should we just kill them or do we care for them as they're dying? And we should treat the unborn the same way. So good answer from Lila. Tough crowd, they're not gonna accept it, but it's a good answer. Should a 10-year-old rape survivor be able to get an abortion? Now, pro-choice advocate Christian Nunez says, absolutely, yet pro-life advocate Lila Rose says, the fetus is not the guilty party. Um, and th those are two very strong uh, opinions. I, I see a lot of my audience wiggling in their chairs. Uh, if you've got something to say, raise your hand. Great, and... I do. I have lots to say, actually. A ton to say, actually. Um, okay. I've been in these situations before where you've got someone who's eager to talk because they absolutely want to be verbally abusive towards you. And you must handle it with grace and poise. And Lila does a good job particular case with Nancy, who I feel absolutely terrible for. Lila, I really feel like your views, you just want to legislate evil. That's really how it feels when I hear you speak, especially when you're talking about a 10-year-old girl who was raped. I'm sorry. And um, to hear you say that, you know, they should just have it anyway is disgusting. I really think you're a traitor to your own. And I will never be able to agree with you. There's nothing you could justify to say that she should have to carry it to bury it. There is nothing you could possibly say to justify that level of lack of empathy. And that's the problem I feel like in this country at the moment, we were founded on the lack of empathy and we've just kept up with that tradition. If, if you have no empathy. Uh, abortion is devastating for, to women's mental health. Where Lila offers her reply, she's gonna talk about the effects of abortion on women, which I don't think is the right path to go down because it gets us away from the main issue, what are the unborn, which she does return to shortly. But I think the reason Lila went down, is about to go down this road is because it's highly probable this woman, you know, she's emotional. She could be a victim of sexual assault. She could be post-abortive. So she has, she's emotional here. And it's important to address that with empathy. And, and it's a fair to say, you know what, you're right. I want to empathize with you. These are very difficult situations. But I want to ask you, if I had a a two-year-old up here who's a product of rape or who is unwanted, shouldn't we treat all people equally in that regard? That, it, you know, we don't kill, and sometimes I do this when the question of rape comes up. Look, in this country, we don't even kill rapists. It's illegal to execute a rapist in this country. But you can execute the child conceived in rape. How is that fair? And that's a, a good way to respond because you're showing empathy and concern to know who the real bad guy here is, that even for the real bad guy, we don't kill him in this country, even though some people would very much like to. Uh, we don't. We don't. The Supreme Court has even said that you can't administer a death penalty for child rape. But the child who is conceived in rape, you can. But let's listen to Lila's response. No one talks about that. The year after a woman has you an know abortion, it's really like the, the year after a woman to have the child. The, what kind of trauma is the that? Trauma that is from the trauma is from the rape. The trauma is from the rape. The child's an innocent party there. The child and is we don't born take out yet. It's not there. We we should not take out generational sin on a child to say there's generational sin and that dad was but an abuser the so the We're child should be killed. At this That's rate. not We're fair to the child. We're talking about rights. And he just yes. said we've been taken. A right has been taken away from us. And what is next? I want to address a right to do what always ask the question, to, to not be pregnant. Anyone has a right to not become pregnant. If someone forces you to become pregnant against your will, that's the crime of rape. But it's not a crime. It's not 
No one has the right to stop being pregnant any more than they have the right to stop being a biological parent. Because in order to do that, you have to kill a child. Laws are meant to protect the weak. In a society, who's the weakest? Who's the weakest in a society? A child. The poor. They don't have a voice. They can't speak. A child the in the room. That's or a, weak. But the poor. a poor child would be the weakest. And we're going to keep them that way. By and, a, and a child with disability. Listen, kids. whether you live 10 minutes or 10 years or 100 years, you're a human life. And you have the right to not be killed. Boom, 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 boom. Yes, that, that was a great line. Whether you live for 10 minutes or 10 years or 100 years, it's not how long you live. It's that you are valuable just because you are a human being. And then she's not taking the bait and she's speaking even though she's being interrupted. And she could have been justified to say, can I please finish your, your answer? But this person is emotional and you have to just give the answer and, and keep going. But nice answer. And that's what the pro-life fight is all about. That's what we're fighting for, a culture of life where we provide real health care. You know, abortion is the intentional destruction of an innocent but human doesn't life. A woman we can have do a better right than that. that for a right to choose what? what a right to choose what? Woman Bingo, right to choose what? See, follow the method here. Always go back to the one question, what are the unborn? A woman have what a right to do? choose what happens to her body? But what's in her body? There's another you life know, we're talking about. Let's acknowledge the science. And I would defer to Christian and the experts, but I will say begins? this. You can't just be pro-fetus and not pro-life. Right. Because both, a lot of we're, times we're what pro, we we're see... We're pro-human beings. No, we're pro-human beings. And women after deserve better than abortion. a lot of these abortion. children are born, they all of those better. legislators who vote for pro-life when the baby's inside the woman, then do nothing to vote to help them with not, health I mean, care, uh, after not, school care, exactly. you know, yeah, daycare, it, all these things, especially in marginalized communities. In the back row. In the and that's, uh, and I don't know, this could have been edited out. That looks like an edit there. So remember in these shows, like with Matt Walsh was on Dr. Phil, things get edited. So in talking about what's happening, it's possible Lila had super good replies on a lot of these things and it got edited out. So we, we do have to keep that in mind. That looks like a hard edit to me. Because I would say here, look, what do we do to help marginalized communities, kids in foster care? We, we, we agree. There's lots of different ways to help. Should we kill them? No. If the unborn are human, we shouldn't do the same thing to them either. Always stay on that one question. Because look how they, he wanted to just back away from the question to get to something that's in friendlier territory for him. Don't let people do that who are advocates in these debate settings. That When people come in and say, you know, we have problems deciding the custody of our kids, so we're going to go to court. And I go, oh, you don't want to do that. You would be much smarter to sit down and work this out between yourselves because you have no idea what the court may do or not do. You want to, you, you don't want the government in your lives. And I, I really don't think the government needs to be telling people what they should do with their bodies. We're out of time. Don't worry. And yet in 2020, in September of 2020, Dr. Phil on his show is talking about how people have a moral responsibility if they choose to not wear masks, to engage in other behaviors so they don't cause other people to contract COVID-19. And so here it sounds like he would support, at least in theory, mask mandates. And I'm sure he would say, well, how's that working out for you? If you don't have them, everyone's going to die. Except now we've seen that after the pandemic's over, mask mandates didn't work, lockdowns didn't work, uh, but that's a topic for another time, of course. But here's somebody who would say, oh, well, no, 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 your choice, you don't have a choice to hurt other people by not wearing a mask. And here, and then government, and this is government has a place to interfere in your life to protect people from a disease like COVID that for many parts of the, the demographics have over a 99% survival rate, yet yeah, the government has no interest in intervening to keep people from dismembering their own children. So it's that's where it's, it's completely inconsistent. But as I said, I think Lila did an amazing job. She should be commended for this. And yeah, just we need to support more pro-life apologists and speakers to be out in public venues, on social media, on these talk shows, whether it's late night, news media, daytime talk show, whatever it may be, we got to keep pushing at this because the pro-choice position is is waking up and they want to take action and be activists in, in light of Dobbs. We cannot afford to rest on our laurels and just sit back and feel like, oh, we won, we're fine. No, this is not a, a victory in the war. This is a crucial battle. And it, the fight for life is ours to lose. 
if we choose to do nothing with this historic opportunity. So let us not do that. But thank you guys so much. Uh, definitely check out on our website at shop.catholic.com. Uh, pick up a copy of our my new booklet, Why We're Pro-Life. Definitely be sure to hand this out to everybody, anybody you can think of. We're going to try to donate as many of these as we can to people in states who are trying to keep abortion from being made a constitutional right or trying to protect the unborn. Definitely get these booklets out there. I'll leave a link in the description below. But thank you guys, and I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.